The subject tonight is on worship. And okay. And I want to say hello to everyone that's able to come out and to everyone on live stream. May the presentation be a blessing to all of us. Okay. So the subject is worship, and the text is Psalms 29, verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I don't know how many of us have ever meditated on this. The fact that glory is due to the Lord, and when or whether is home worship or Sabbath worship or any time we meet together to worship, do we have in mind that we're coming to glorify God or has it just become a form? Are we fully there mentally, emotionally, and when I say physically, I'm meaning conscious-wise. Are we there 100% when we come before God and we're there to glorify his name? And not only to glorify him because it is what is due to him for all that he does for us. And if we are meditating every day doing the self-examination, spending the time with the Lord, we know why glory is due for all that he does. We might not have all that we want. And we might be going through a particularly hard time or trial. But the fact that we are here shows that the Lord is with us. Otherwise, we would be like all the other people in the world that find a way to escape. Whether it be a lot of movies, whether it be sleeping away your life, a lot of complaining, alcohol, drugs, uh, immoral behavior, um, bad attitude, we're mean, we're disconnected. And so as the people of God saying that we can see and know God and that as Davidians especially, that we understand why we have trials. We understand that the Lord is training us. We understand that he never leaves us nor forsakes us and that all that comes to us comes from a loving God who holds the cup to our lips and he knows just how much we can take and that all things really do, once we've passed through it, all things really did work out for good. So knowing this then, when we sit down to have worship, are we there to glorify his name for all that he's done? And if we think that we're the ones getting up and we're the ones going to work and we're the ones feeding ourselves and making a living and we're making ourselves breathe and giving ourselves health, But as Christians, we know that's not true. So we have lots of reasons just being able to be in our right minds, to get ready, to, get, to have the strength to get dressed, and to come here and sit. That in itself is evidence that God is there. So glory is due to his name. 
And then when we worship, do we worship him in the beauty of holiness? Are we bringing an offering that is clean? The offering that we have, are we giving it to him with clean hands, a clean heart, a pure mind, pure thoughts? We're here fully to think about him to concentrate on his word and to walk from here with the blessing that he has for us today. Are we going to leave here with the blessing or are we going to leave the same way we came with things on our minds, with bad feelings, with revenge on our minds? Did we come prepared? Do we know that we're to pray before we come? So do we feel when we sit before the Lord that we're beautiful and in our own beauty, a beautiful Christian life, that also brings glory to God. So with these thoughts in mind, let us, um, kneel and pray with those who are able. Our Father which art in heaven, we want to praise you and thank you for keeping us all through another week for all that you have done for us and through us. We want to thank you for a savior. We want to thank you for this day where we're, we're waiting to welcome in the Sabbath. And meanwhile, we're here to hear your words of instructions. And we pray that that would give us power of concentration May the Holy, we invite the Holy Spirit that he will enable all of us to understand and to accept and to be sanctified by these words. We pray not only for ourselves here, but all our brethren on live stream and all the brethren that are bringing in the Sabbath in spirit and in truth. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> our first reading is from 2SR, page 143. The sacrifice and religious worship of the two firstborn in the human family. Who were the two firstborn? Cain and Abel because Adam and Eve were created. So the first, the two firstborn in the human family reveals that the savior of the world had made known the divine plan of salvation to the family of Adam. Their system of worship being devised by the creator himself was perfect and able to save the sinner from his sin. Abel's careful religious observance, according to the instruction of the deity whom he worshiped, shows that only such worship, honor and praise can be acceptable to God. So there is a religious worship that the God of heaven has made known and the system, this system of worship, God himself made, he devised it, it's perfect and it's able to save the sinner from his sin. So Abel was careful to observe 
this system of worship because he wanted to be saved from his sins. And so he did according to the instructions that God gave. And this is the only worship, honor and praise that is acceptable to God. Now the question is, do we know the same system of worship? And are we being careful, religious observers of it? And do we know that if we are, then we can claim or know that we are saved from our sins. Same page, and it went on to say, or went on to describe Cain. We read about Abel, but Cain was not mindful. Where Abel was careful, Cain was not even mindful of the commandment. And thus, by <clears throat> presenting that which God had not required, went about to establish a religion of his own. As he immediately afterwards slew his brother, it should be an object lesson to all that a worship according to the inclination of men, however good and innocent it may seem, cannot sanctify and save the worshiper. But instead, it takes him deeper into sin and final ruin. Those who are inclined to persecute the ones who do not worship as they do are bowing down with Cain at the altar made of bricks. Because God's altar in that day was made out of what? How many stones? Twelve. So it was, it was a certain amount, certain size, and they had to arrange it a certain way. Where, if you remember the chart, Cain's uh, altar of bricks, it looked prettier than uh, Abel's rough stones. But then that, that was only to our satisfaction, to man's satisfaction, not to God, because God found it unacceptable. <clears throat> Such altars are the product of man by converting the form of the original. And though more attractive than the altar of stone may seem, there is no sanctifying power in them, and their worship is as deadly poison. The evidence cannot be denied that both forms of worship, true and false, were introduced at about the same time and ran side by side. Most seem innocent and were conducted about the same way with the distinction that the one is in harmony with God's book and law and the other is not. So when we're worshiping, are we sure that we're not doing this? Just to show up and just to sing and to read and to sing again, and to pray, and you finish. Are we sure that what we just did was at the altar of stone, according to God's system, which is perfect, according to the system that 
according to the system that sanctifies and saves the sinner? Or are we just going through the motions? And because we did it, we feel, we feel satisfied within ourselves. And we think God is happy with the way we're worshiping him. Is our worship glorifying him? And are we worshiping in the beauty of holiness? Because if not, then he says, that kind of worship is as a deadly poison. And all it does is take us deeper into sin and into final ruin. So as Davidians, we have to know that we really are worshiping God 100% the way he requires us to worship him. So <clears throat> it says, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. So this is one way, this is one of the requirements that the Lord says that we sing to him. So do we sit there because we think we cannot sing or because we don't feel like singing or we don't like the song or my throat is dry, my mind is distracted. So we're really either not singing, singing under our breath, actually mumbling a song to the Lord and we think he's happy with that. Or do we really come to sing as well as we can with our whole heart and our whole mind actually understanding what we're singing up there and we are in our singing assenting to the words of the song. So we can, you know, we can do that. And, and in singing, do we work so hard that when we're having worship, that we're like not really singing, your mind's not on it, you're really tired, and it actually sounds terrible? No, seriously. I tell you a story. It's not a joke, but one time, Lloyd and I, we did extra work and this and that, and it was a pretty hard day. We went home, and you plop down, and you're tired, and you're singing. So we sang the first song, we did the reading. We're both half asleep, and then when we're closing, all of a sudden we both became conscious that we were not singing the hymn that we had open in front of us. Not only because we allowed our minds to get too tired, and instead of maybe deep breathing or just fighting, determining to pay attention and to worship God with all our heart and mind, we let ourselves sit there too sleepy to fight sleep. So we're half asleep and we're both singing. We're both not singing the song and each of us was singing our own song. <laughs> I'm serious. Because all of a sudden it's like we both became, what, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you singing? And, <laughs> and he said, what are you singing? You know? And so we said, you know, we, so we actually repented and told the Lord to forgive us because that was a lousy offering. You know? So we do our best. So far, we've never done it <laughs> again. By the grace of God, we won't do that. But we come to sing. Singing is part of serving him and is part of worship. 
He wants us to sing. So why don't we sing? And why do we lie to ourselves and say that, um, well, I can't sing? Everyone sings. And if you put your mind to it, you can improve in singing, you know. I sing, I'm more able to sing now than when I first came. Yeah, so really getting, letting your mind go into it. And, uh, and I really learned to give it all I had was in the Philippines because we had to teach him the Bayesian song. And it came to my mind, well, it didn't come to my mind. The Holy Spirit made me see that before I started singing, he said, the, I, don't sing the way you sing at Bayesian. You know, it came to me. You're going to sit here half singing, sounding, and it said, if you want them to be 100% for Bayesian, you got to sing like you actually feel about Bayesian. Okay? And Bayesian is my love. So I started from the Philippines singing loud, singing from my gut instead of from my throat. You know, so we, you can do it. Anybody can improve. Three Code 7, page 15. When Zion shall arise and shine, her light will be most penetrating and precious songs of praise and thanksgiving will be heard in the assemblies of the saints. Why not awake the voice of our spiritual songs in the travels of our pilgrimage? So are we waiting until we're on Mount Zion? Do you think that we can stand here and, and sound awful before the Lord? And once, you know, we read here for worship, we read for worship years ago that the Lord isn't honored when we feel that a song should be faster or whether we feel a song should be slower but everybody's singing a same song the way they feel like singing it. And you hear this, what? What do you hear? Huh? No, I wouldn't say confusion. Hmm? Singing's supposed to be harmonious, right? Is it harmonious if one jumps in and someone's dragging along and then the other side or someone else is already starting the other voice and the other one's still holding the last note from the previous stanza? It says he's not happy with that. That's why Abation, in the past, we had someone to start a song and we were taught that Whoever starts the song, you're supposed to sing with them. You're not supposed to think, well, he's singing it too slow, and so then you're going to speed it up, and you're jumping ahead, and they're lagging behind. It says that it's, um, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot what kind of noise it said that it sounded like to the, to the Lord. But I do remember that it was unacceptable. Excuse me? Bedlam of noise? Bellum? Bedlam, yeah. I don't know, I don't remember. I don't remember, but it's supposed to be harmonious. And, and if, even if we think that it's too slow or too fast, we're not to change the pace. 
We're supposed to be one harmonious voice before the Lord. It says, as a part of religious service, singing is as much an act of worship as is prayer and is a great solace and inspiration to us as we strive to win a place in the congregation of the saints, the 144,000, when the purification shall have taken place. But if we are not trying to come before God and give him an act of worship in harmonious singing on this side, you think we're going to be on the other side to do it? We have a perfect system of worship, and it's that system that saves the sinner from his sin. That's what we read earlier. So to come and not to worship the Lord as he asks of us, then it's up to you to determine whether you're being saved from your sins. Sometimes we do not know the song, and are you hearing? Hmm? Can you hear me? I'm hearing. Yes. Yeah, sometimes we do not know the song, mm -hmm. and we try to, you know, sing. Uh, maybe we should not try to sing it if we don't know it because it's not done properly. Okay. I know when I learn new songs, I usually don't sing the first line. I listen. I try to hear the, what do you call it? Right, the, the tempo, the rhythm, the, the pace. You're trying to learn the song, the music, how it goes. And then when I feel that I can do a decent job of it, then I jump in and sing. You know, that's the suggestion that we can do. But it does happen because songs are there, they're put there, and you don't, you don't know. But, see, that's an exception to the rule. I'm talking about the attitude of worship when uh, you don't feel like it, so you don't. We don't feel like it, so we don't. And we're not, what that is saying is, it's like God's not here. You know, you showed up and you're part of a head count, but you're not really here. You're not worshiping. So little things like that, if your throat is dry, you have a sore throat, there's always an exception, is the motive. We know that. It's the motive. But if you come and it's your habit to come and sit and not sing, half sing, mumble, and you're singing, looking out the window, and, you know, and we're distracted, then, like I say, judge, we're to judge ourselves according to what's written. It says, um, and as we pray and sing in the spirit and with understanding, our songs will express the truth and experiences of the message of present truth. And then we shall see that the temple of God is opened in heaven and the threshold flushed with the glory, which is for every church that will love God and keep his commandments. Then we shall have spiritual eyesight to discern the inner courts of the celestial temple. We shall catch the themes of song and thanksgiving of the heavenly choir round about the throne. 
this is something to keep our minds on and try to use our imagination to see that we are singing with the angels, that glory is opened up in heaven towards us, and that we are worshiping with heaven and heaven with us, and therefore we get, we're blessed. Okay, it says, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in present truth. Hence, the ensuing song is the beginning of our response to the words of the psalmist. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of his saints. So if we consider ourselves part of the congregation of the saints. If we really believe we're a saint, then we should be engaging in this true worship. Let believers of present truth, as they assemble together for worship, lift their hearts and voices heavenwards. Your heart is your mind, your emotions, your affection. And that's where we've heard before that's in your middle brain. So when it says your heart, it's talking about your mind, where the seat of your emotions are, your affections are. So your voice and your heart should be into it. In this song of experience and praise, and as they thus sing a new song and make a joyful noise, they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. So are we conscious then that when we hear that we see God as the majesty of heaven and we're here to worship him? It says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I put the picture of the family because you have to learn to worship at home first before you, you learn in church. Our meeting should be spirited and social and not too long. Reserve, pride, vanity, and fear of man should find no place there. Let, <clears throat> sorry, little differences and prejudices should not be taken with us to these meetings. Again, when we come through the door and we sit here, have we prepared ourselves to worship God or are we remembering the last thing that offended us? Or some disgruntled uh, complaint that we have? Are we too sleepy? Are we reserved? Some of us are reserved, and we don't want to sing out loud. And we don't want to say amen. We don't want to testify. We think we have nothing to say, or, or the people won't like our testimony. But you're testifying. We are testifying to the Lord of his mercy and his love and his goodness? Do we come with pride? Do we come with vanity? Are we more worrying about the hair and the hat and the dress and the shoes all matching and looking? Or are we coming here knowing that we're clean, it's well-fitting, it's according to God's dress code, and we know we're presentable before him? And so we're ready to worship. Or is there vanity involved? See, the Lord, the Lord knows his people, and he's trying to save us. So no one is throwing innuendos uh, or pointing out anyone. This is to look at it. If the Holy Spirit lets you know this one is you and that one is you, Let's deal with it. 
Let's repent of it. And then let's get the blessing from it by engaging from then on with true worship. It says, Zia, the light of the world, says the heavenly teacher, as a united family, simplicity, meekness, confidence, and love should exist in the hearts of brethren and sisters who meet to be refreshed and invigorated by bringing their lights together. See, now this is what we will get if we come here to worship, refreshed and invigorated. That means we got our blessings. A living experience is made up of daily trials, conflicts, temptations, strong efforts, and victories and a great peace and joy gained through Jesus. A simple relation of such experiences gives light, strength, and knowledge that will aid others in their advancement in the divine life. So whatever our testimony is, it's going to help somebody else. It says the worship of God should be both interesting and instructive to those who have any love for divine and heavenly things. Let the family, that first one spoke about the church, the church family. This is the individual family. It says, let the family worship be made pleasant and interesting. Children should be taught to respect the hour of prayer. They should be required to rise in the morning so as to be present at family worship. Okay, so therefore, for you not to have a hard time getting them up, then it, they need to have religion made attractive not repulsive. The hour of family worship should be the happiest hour of the day. Let the reading of the scriptures be well chosen and simple. Let the children join in singing and let the prayers be short and right to the point because you want them to want to learn to worship God. They're not the Christians, we are. The children are not the Davidians, we are. And if we're making it something distasteful and tedious, well, you really expect them to like it? If we were their age, would we like it? No? So you make it attractive. And don't go into worship with fussing and, and the attitude and the hard talk and the... We really need to examine ourselves. And if we ourselves are prepared to come before God and worship, truly worship him, and they can see what we're getting out of it, and we're happy, then they, that's what they learn, because we're... They are being trained. So however you conduct worship, that's what you're teaching them. That's what we're teaching them. So we can't, we can't say that the child is hard-headed and thick and, and, and possessed and all kind of thing and think as the child and we're making a tedious, you know, repulsive thing like it says to them. <laughs> okay. The our family worship should be made the happiest of the day, right? Evening and worship, evening and morning, join with your children in God's worship, reading his word and singing his praise. Teach them to repeat God's law. They're learning. So we have to make it pleasant so that they would want to. That's what the world does, and that's why our own children, 
They know the worldly songs. They know the worldly dance. They know all the foolishness. A lot of the children's program have, are set to music and a lot of foolishness. And they pick it up like that. See, so if it's made interesting and, like it says, happy, they will automatically drink it in. Children should be taught to respect and reverence the hour of prayer. Before leaving the house for labor, all the family should be called together and the father or the mother in the father's absence should plead fervently with God to keep them through the day. Come in humility with a heart full of tenderness and with a sense of the temptations and dangers before yourselves and your children. By faith, bind them upon the altar, entreating for them the care of the Lord. Ministering angels will guard children who are thus dedicated to God. It is the duty of Christian parents, morning and evening, by earnest prayer and persevering faith, to make a hedge about their children. They should patiently instruct them, kindly and untiringly teach them how to live in order to please God. It's a school you're teaching. They're not the Christian or Davidian, we are. So we want them to take our religion so the religion has to be a source of joy and happiness to them, right? And they have to know that when you call them to pray over them, they're actually being blessed. See, these are the things we should tell them why we're doing things. You know, I had a way always of talking and talking to the kids and my mom was from the old school and she told me, you talk too much. You talk too much to those children. They should do it because you say so. That is true in a way because it tells you that children should learn to obey before they can reason. But not explaining to them why something is good for them and you just setting yourself every day for worship to go into a struggle because they want to give in to their feelings, not understanding what it is that you're doing. But if they know that you are blessing them, therefore an angel is keeping them, maybe we wouldn't get such a hard time. Let the season seasons of family worship be short and spirited. Do not let your children or any member of your family dread them because of their tediousness or lack of interest. When a long chapter is read and explained and a long prayer is offered, this precious service becomes wearisome and it is a relief when it is over. Let the Father select a portion of scripture that is interesting and easily understood. A few verses will be sufficient to furnish a lesson which may be studied and practiced through the day. Questions may be asked. A few earnest, interesting remarks made or an incident short and to the point may be brought in by way of illustration. At least a few verses of spirited song may be sung and the prayer offered should be short and pointed. The one who leads in prayer should not pray about everything, but should express his needs in simple words and praise God with thanksgiving. So there's no reason why we should be having 
hard times. Okay. Are you going to open the Sabbath? No? Okay. All right. Well, yeah. We're going to stop here. And we're going to uh, bring in the Sabbath. So, <clears throat> let us kneel and pray with uh, Alina. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, grateful for another week that you have brought us through safely. We are grateful to see another Sabbath day. We thank you for this presentation that is brought before us about worship. We do ask that you will help us, dear Father, where we lack, that we will come up to the standard that you are presenting before us. Please continue to be with us as we listen to your words and to your people and to be with your people worldwide in Jesus' name. Amen. We read this. All right. I worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. And Brother Trevor had mentioned that this before, that truly one of the problems of human nature or mankind is that we have no fear of God, truly. We're afraid of people, we're afraid of situations, we're afraid of being without. We have a lot of fears. We'll get sick, like what's going on right now. There's a lot of fear in the world today. But we have many human fears and not the proper fear of God. We don't come here. If we had a healthy fear of who the God of heaven is, we would put more effort, we should put more effort into engaging wholeheartedly mind, heart and soul into worship determined that we're going to leave worship whether here whether in church whether at home that we're going to get the blessings that God has for us in having worship even if we have it alone you know if it would help us then to have well, it does say you should have a clean place. You should have a neat, clean place where you have your worship. And you can sing with your whole heart, engaged with your voice. You know, I once met a sister that uh, she didn't have worship because she lived alone. And she didn't think it was worship, so she, most of the time, she didn't bother. But if we fully understood the purpose of worship, then we all would want it, okay? So this is my last reading. It says, God's presence is not confined to the splendid edifice. Jacob's humble resting place had been consecrated by a manifestation of divine glory. And what is that referring to? His humble resting place was consecrated by a manifestation of divine glory. That's when he was out in the wilderness and he had the vision and God spoke to him 
Okay. God has often made sacred the hillside, the caves of the earth, the forest, the humble barn, the cotton tent, each had become a tabernacle where he meets and blesses his servants who are humbly seeking after truth and peace and righteousness. This is how we should be leaving, that we have grown in truth, we have peace of mind, and we're set to do right. And the grandest cathedral, but the grandest cathedral, the marvel of architecture, if it encloses pride, dead forms, hollow hypocrisy, is repulsive in the sight of God, who seeketh such to worship him as worship in spirit and in truth. truth. He wants us to worship in our spirit, our emotions, our heart, our mind, and in truth. Okay? According to his perfect system of worship. His truth, the message tells us how to do this, to worship God in spirit and in truth with a heart overflowing with love to God and making melody in harmony with the happy songsters, Jacob went forward on his journey. He felt indeed that the presence of the unseen was with him and that angels were his companions. So by the grace of God, may we leave here feeling the same way that we have been instructed in God's truth. It has secured or confirmed um, our peace of mind. And we are leaving here to do right as far as worship. And that leaving here we know that we have the presence of God and that angels are our companions. So God bless you.